Okay. As many of you know that I give lots and lots and lots of talks, not just here but overseas as well. And they're all put on the internet, on YouTube. There's over a thousand of my talks on YouTube. So it's always tough to get a new subject and try and get a, a talk which you haven't heard before. There's always going to be some repetition, but last week, that after the talk had finished, during the question time, one lady asked me, just one of the really nice questions, and I was going to give a talk about that question this evening. Didn't really have a time to answer it fully, and that was, why are we here? It's very nice, it just gets to the heart of things. What are you doing here in this life on planet Earth? And of course, uh, when we are born, we're not given that answer. We're just here, we arrive, not really understanding what we're supposed to do with our life. And of course, we sometimes we just follow what other people do. But not many of you can stand just being sheep for a while. When it comes to sheep, I always remember the little story told me by one of our monks, Wisarada, who he grew up in a farm just uh, outside of Mandijong. He really was a local boy. And he said that once, you know, he went out to check on the sheep in the farm. And he saw the sheep. He didn't know how they started, but they were, had formed a circle around a thick uh, lump of bushes. So they could not see the other side of the bush, but they'd formed a circle and they were walking round and round and round, as sheep always do, following the one in front. And they didn't realize that they were going round and round and round in a circle which had no end. And if he hadn't have chanced on this and pulled one of the sheep out of line, they'd be still walking around that circle <laughs> years later. And that's, you know, what sheep do. They follow the one in front, not realizing they're getting nowhere, they're just going round and round. And of course, you now what we're doing here, we follow other people first of all. But then we are born with this wonderful mind which will always question. And that's really important to develop that questioning mind. It's what's one of the reasons I was in, uh, enticed into Buddhism, because you were allowed to question, you were encouraged to question. You weren't supposed to just believe what the book says, what the teacher said. It was not a guru tradition, it was a tradition where every person was an island, a lamp to themselves. The teachers, even the Buddha, only shows the way, it doesn't tell you what to believe. So the idea of dogma in Buddhism was just not there from the beginning. If anyone really understands what Buddhism is, there is no such thing as dogma. Just, you know, this is how you can find out for yourself. And that really attracted me, the questioning and not just being sheep. So when it comes to what we're doing here, we don't just follow what other people say, we learn how to find out for ourselves. So we start off in life, you know, enjoying our life, you know, finding fulfillment in pleasure. There's lots of things to find pleasure in in this life. You know, in movies, in Harry Potter, in Superman, you know, and obviously just in travel, and all the things which you spend a lot of your money on, seeking pleasures in life, you know, sex, relationships. But we always find out that, you know, that search for meaning in physical pleasure, even if it's going to see just this amazing scenery. I'm getting a bit too old now, but you know, you go and see just beautiful landscapes. I remember going on a pilgrimage once and going to the Taj Mahal. And it's supposed to be one of those places to tick off on your, what they call these days, bucket lists. You know, to see these great monuments, which you know, people say are one of the wonders of the world. You go, and s go there and you sit there and you ask, why is this beautiful? Why do so many people come here? Is there something inherently beautiful in this structure? Or is it just because I'm a sheep and other people have said it's beautiful, therefore it must be beautiful, therefore I'll go there and get my photograph taken there, tick that one off. You know, it's always as a monk, as a human being, you're always questioning, is that really it? You know, to see all these places. And of course, there's no end of places you can go and visit these days on these tours. 
And is that the meaning of life, to actually to go and see the rainforest, the Amazon? And after a while, you know, the pleasures. You know, I always remember you know, reading poetry when I was young. You know, I was actually a really great admirer of John Keats, the, the uh, romantic poets. And I actually learned that I could actually quote them. Uh, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. That's the start of Endymion. And oh, for a glass of vintage of cool, clear ale. And how does that go? That was another of John Keats' poems. And I, you know, I, I knew these, and I would take them with me and read them. And just, you know, it was into sort of the, the pleasure of the world. But then I started reading books like, even like by Robert Burns. And he had a passage there which totally uh, abolished you know, the illusion of finding happiness in pleasure. And it was that pleasures are like poppies spread, not the poppy. Maybe you have to be sort of a Northern European to know the poppy. Pleasures are like poppies spread. You pluck the flower and the bloom is shed. It's a particular type of flower, as soon as you pick it, the petals fall off. Or like the snowfall in the river, white for a moment and then gone forever. And now, that is not exactly how he pronounced it, but you know, I'm not Scots, so please excuse me for mispronouncing you know, one of the great poets of that land. But that was the essence of his poem. Pleasures are like poppies spread. And we search for meaning in pleasure. And we have a lot of pleasure in life. We go and see great rock bands. And I, I say that in my early years, I saw some incredible bands. The, first, the very first concert of Led Zeppelin, I went to a place in Chalk Farm, north of London, called The Roundhouse. And there was this all-night concert, two hours of, of um, The Doors you know, uh, Morrison, and then followed by two hours of Jefferson Airplane. It was, later became Jefferson Starship, and another two hours of The Doors, and another two hours of Airplane. Eight hours of one of the, two of the best rock bands, you know, ever. And, but afterwards, it was gone. And you can understand that you just had to seek more pleasure to get any meaning. It never meant anything in the long term. And so, you know, why else were we here? And of course, you know, then, you know, later on in life, we get into relationships, you know, where we start to experience love, and you know, love for another human being, and the closeness of that love, and the trust and the vulnerability of that love, which again gives a more powerful meaning to things. But that love to another person, you know, sometimes it lasts, sometimes it fades. And if it does last, it doesn't last forever. And I notice that most people in their search for meaning in life, they often stop there, you know, with this thing we call love, and not really understanding what it is, but getting some, some sense, some taste that there is some meaning in this thing. And it can be incredibly fulfilling for a while. But it's not just a love for another person, a love for your kids and the the love your kids show to you, which is incredibly sweet, that selflessness when you come home from work and your little five-year-old just runs to you. Welcome home, mummy. There's something in that which has far more meaning than any sort of pleasure. And this is something which you look at, why? And it is most people feel that finding that love and experiencing that love and giving that love is the highest meaning of the world. And when you look at it, first of all, so much of that love is like the poppy, pluck the flower, the bloom is shed. may not be straight away, but after a while. In my job, don't think that I don't know about life. I did have my relationships before I became a monk. And also, you know, you deal with people, you talk with people, you watch them almost from a distance as they go through their relationships and also when they go through the end of the relationships, especially you know, when somebody dies and passes away. And all the pleasure of that love you share together is replaced by this almost intolerable pain called grief. When someone you love so much, a young child, gets taken away. I read in the news there was some police car chase somewhere and a little 14 or 15 year old girl just was just playing in a garden, got killed. 
How can those mother and father cope with that? Just in the safety of their garden, of their house, the yard, front yard, you know, some police chase, some person committing a crime and the police doing what they have to do and the car crashing through the fence and ending the life of a beautiful little girl only 14 months or 15 months old. The pain of that. And then you find out why is it all these funerals which I do, and I do so many of them, the grief always comes without love. And one of the reasons is that if we want to find meaning in life, that particular love, please don't confine it to a person. Keep it separate from the person, but includes that person. This is one of the things which, as a monk, you know, people say, don't you miss, as a monk, having a relationship? I say, what do you mean? I have so many relationships as a monk, with each one of you. And I don't mean sexual, I mean something much bigger, the big opening the door of your heart and including each one of you into my lives whenever you are in front of me. And I always think that when you don't put love onto a person, but you put it around that person, include it, and you don't just confine it and limit it to one being or two beings or three beings or seven beings, then you find when that being goes, the love is still there. This is one of the things which I learned from Buddhism. We have this beautiful thing called love, but we attach it to a being. We attach it to a thing. And then when it's attached to a thing, when that being goes, the love goes with it replaced by pain. But for many people, you know, teaching, learning through meditation, through come to places like this, somebody dies, but the love stays. It doesn't go. It doesn't end up with pain and with crying and with grief and not being able to go to work for weeks and years afterwards. That pain of grief is not there when we learn that love is not in a person, that love is just around them surrounds them, soaks into them, but not confined to one particular being. I tried to make that point last week when I talked about space. And when anybody lives in that space, they leave a mark there, an indelible mark there, and they disappear, but the space is changed forever. You know, that space in your life, the person comes into your life, a friend, a father, a mother, and they're no longer here, but they've left a mark, and that mark never goes away. And this is what I'm talking about by this thing which we call love. Changes the space and it's not with a person. It's totally independent of them. Maybe that person sparks and generates that love just like a wood can start a fire or oil starts a fire. But the oil is not the fire. The person is not the love. The love is something which that person ignites and which is separate and exists independently. And when you start understanding something like love like that, you can understand that a person leaves, the love remains. A person dies, the love is still there. And it's not replaced by the grief like something has been stolen from you. The person disappears, but not the happiness, not the love, not the beauty. That will always remain. This is where we, I call it, detach the love, not make it a person. But when we receive that love, sometimes when we receive that love, you know, we just attach onto it. And sometimes, why is it so nice to be loved? Why do people search for that love? One of the things is that because it gives us a sense of worth. At last, that somebody respects us. I must be okay because somebody loves us. That search for meaning of being worthwhile in this life, if we can't get that from many people, at least we can get it from one person, the person who loves us. That's why a mother's love is just so beautiful. And if you've been fortunate to have a mother's love, because a mother will love you no matter who you are. You know, you see mothers going down the road past our monastery visiting their kids in prison. It doesn't matter what their kid does. If their kid's a burglar, but my son, he's not any old burglar. My son is the best burglar in the whole of WA. And there's something very beautiful and lovable in, in that. 
you know, the mother's love for their kid. And you know, my own story is my own mother's love for their kid. You know, I went to visit my mother for the first time after seven years as a monk. That was 33 years ago. What year would that be? 1980 something. And you know, this was time you know, in London where monks weren't cool. You know, we were just weirdos. I mean, real strange people. And so when I went to visit my mother, and her weekly routine was on a Saturday morning doing her shopping. She was working as a secretary. So she hadn't time to get all the sort of groceries and other stuff for looking after the apartment. So Saturday morning will be shopping time. Saturday afternoon going to the hairdressers. She had a routine. And I went all that way to spend time to hang out with my mother. I hadn't seen her for seven years. So I asked, can I come with you? You know, on your shopping in the Saturday morning. And I thought I was ready for her to say no because she might be ashamed to be seen with this son dressed like a girl, brown rose, bald head. That was really weird. And, of course, he said, no, no, come. And so when we walked you know, to the shops, again, I thought she would, you know, like teenagers, walking like a couple of meters in front of mum and dad. You know, a couple of meters behind, you know, I'm not associated with these, mum and dads aren't cool. But no, she was right beside me. And then, for those people who know London, the, the streets are very narrow and it's full of traffic. And they have a, a small sidewalk. And in order to protect the pedestrians on the pavement, the sidewalk from the traffic, they have railings. And it's the railings where people, when they enter the shops, they usually leave the prams with the kids inside and they tie the dogs there. And I thought that's where my mother would leave me, <laughs> with the dogs and the, and the babies. You know, not to take me inside the shop because I think these are her friends she sees us every week. You know, they know each other and she'd be embarrassed you know, to see me, but no. She dragged me into the first shop and news agents where she got some weekly magazines. And to my surprise, she introduced me, this is my son, the monk. <laughs> she was proud of me. And that was something I never expected because I never knew just the love of a mother for the son was what we call unconditional. And if I was a bank robber, if I was some, even please excuse me, a paedophile, she would not be ashamed of me. Here's my son, the paedophile. No, that's going a bit too far, I apologize, but <laughs> you get what I mean there. A mother's love for her son is totally unconditional. And that was really something which inspired me. And it's, you know, it taught me, I learn much more from life than you learn from these books. And that type of love is something which is very beautiful. And it's something which you know, gives our life meaning. And it's something we aspire to. Sometimes you don't make it. And I often tell people, those of you who are married, have you got your relationship up to that level of unconditional love? Or is it still, I love you as long as you're faithful, darling? As long as you don't spend too much on the credit card? As long as you're home early enough and you take out the garbage and you look after it? So much of our relationship is so conditional, it's got rules to it. But you know, a lot of people, you know, they do you know, have a relationship with someone, don't, don't care whether it's the same sex or whatever, and sometimes they do get to that point, and it's beautiful when they do, when they say, darling, you know, the door of my heart really is open to you, no matter what you do. I love you, unconditionally. And I've seen that happen in some beautiful cases. Just one which, which comes to my mind. This man, he was a good friend, he used to come to our monastery, he was a bit of a cockney. I was the only one who could really understand him when he came to our monastery. And, uh, you know, after a while he decided, you know, he wanted to leave his wife. And you know, he found another girl, you know, much younger than him. And so he got divorced from his wife and went to live with uh, this other girl. You know, he broke up and his wife was devastated. But later on, you know, after three or four or five years, he was a good guy. You know, he's sort of uh, split from this uh, second wife. 
And about that time, his first wife got very sick. And he went to visit her in hospital and held her hand when she died. And she said, even though you left me, I never stopped loving you, George. I, I'd always forgive you. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, that wife you had. And he said, you know, I was so wrong to, to have, uh, have left you. You know, I was just stupid. I didn't realize just how beautiful your love was. It was unconditional, even though I caused you pain. And just after about 40 years of marriage, I decided to, you know, go with somebody else. And I know the other girl, she was a really good girl. You know, you can't really criticize people, but that woman he married first of all, now she was, she understood what love was. Totally unconditional and forgiving. Could you do that to your partner? If you could, you know, you've gone to that next stage of, of what real love is. Again, parents can do that to their kids, kids can do that to their parents, but you can take it to another level yet. Why is it we only have the unconditional love to a person, our family? Why can't we have that unconditional love, which is not attached to a person, which is just there, which can meet anybody who comes into your your range of vision and speech, who comes close to you. And that's the, not just unconditional love, but unspecified love. And that's something which is, again, totally different. And you know that that is the love you have when the people you're very close to leave. They're not there anymore. But your love remains. Our, our problem is that our love is on a person. It's a fire which needs some sort of fuel rather than a fire which now is totally independent of fuel. A love which doesn't choose a person which is just there for anybody who's right in front of you. You know that some time ago I, I said some of these old stories but every one of these old stories, you read it, you can take it to another level and another level and another level, it just goes deeper and deeper. Now the old story, the Emperor's Three questions, most important time now, most important person, the one in front of you, most important thing to do is to care. That was such an amazing story for me because it showed that the most important person in the world is not the one you love the most, not the one you know, you're married to, not your kid, not your parents, the one you think is really important, it's the one right in front of you right now. So right, you're right in front of me now. At this moment, you are the most important person in the world for me. But not anymore. <laughs> not someone else's. But what that really means is your love is independent of the object. You just give it to the one who is right in front of you. And what does that love actually mean? It means this the third of the Empress Three Questions. The one in front of you is the most important person. What's the most important thing to do is to care. To care for somebody. Now what does that really mean? It means you're respecting them, they're important for you, and you are not trying to change them. You're caring for them. To understand what I mean, that other little story I'm bringing in here, many of my famous stories, bringing them in to support this particular point. The doctor, he's not here this evening, he lost his first patient, first year as a doctor, as an intern, came to see me, wanted to resign, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. Why? He said, because I had to tell. I had to tell this girl's widow, this young man, the one he loved the most in his life, is dead. And your kids have got no mother. And he could see just the pain in this poor young man's face. He'd just come back from the hospital, I don't know if it was Royal Perth or Charlie Gardner's, just having told, you know, this poor guy, you know, that he'd lost his wife and kids had no mum. And that just hurt him so much. Can you imagine having to do that? He said, I can't do this anymore, I have to just give in. I can't be a doctor, because that's going to happen again and I just can't face having to be the one who tells somebody that incredibly painful news. And that's when I told him, he said, you've misunderstood what being a doctor is all about. If you think that being a doctor is curing all your patients, you are going to fail so many times in your life. You're going to go through this so many times. 
And the reason is because you haven't understood what the role of a doctor is. The role of a doctor is not to cure, it's to care. To care for your patients. Not to cure them. And you'll know what I mean, because if curing is the number one thing you're supposed to do, some of the interventions which happen in hospitals today, cure at all costs. Forget about caring for the patients. If it hurts, it's going to prolong their life unnecessarily. That's curing. Caring is a totally different agenda. And if it's caring, a lot of times, now I've got to care for this person, it's time to let them go. No more interventions. The quality of their moment is more important than keeping them alive. And I say, if your job as a doctor is to care for people, you will never have to fail. You can always care for people. You can't always cure them. Therefore, you can always be a successful doctor. You will lose many of your patients. They will die. But you'll be able to go to their widow, to their family and say they were cared for. They were cared for to the max. And the, per the family, yeah, they'll be sad. But they'll realize everything was done and your loved one died being loved and cared for. Now, that's an example of what I mean by one in front of you is really important. And the thing to do is to care for them. Stop trying to cure people. Change your kids, change your wife, change your husband. Stop trying to cure everybody. Care for them instead. It's a totally different ball game. And now you get to understand what this beautiful thing called love is. And when you start to experience this, you realize this actually gives a huge lot of meaning for your life. You realize maybe this is what I was put here for to learn about this, what it really is like to love. And sometimes you need to be loved, first of all, to actually understand that, and to actually to realize just what it's like to be cared for, not cured, to be accepted for just who you are, someone who will not really even put any effort into trying to change you. With all of your faults, with all of your stupidities, with all of the bad jokes you say every week, you still love you. And so, that is the cue for today's bad joke. <laughs> in, the, in the autopsy room of the hospital, the coroner has three bodies, and all three bodies are smiling. And the police have to be there, and he said, to the, the coroner, no, no, is it coroner, the pathologist, whatever it is, the coroner, he said, what happened to this guy, why is he smiling? And he said, this guy, you can see, he was about 70 years of age, he was having sex with his mistress, and that's when he had a heart attack. That explains his smile. Fair enough. What about this guy? This guy won a thousand dollars in the lottery, went to the pub, and drank so much whiskey, he died of liver failure. That's why he's got the big smile on his face. Fair enough, said the police. What about this guy? He said, this guy was struck by lightning. Well, how come he's got a big smile on the face? Because he thought he was having his photograph taken. <laughs> so that's my bad joke for the day. No, it's a, it's a waste of time trying to cure me. <laughs> I'm going to be <laughs> inflicting these on you till I die. But that's the difference between <laughs> curing and caring. And so sometimes we understand this is where we have another meaning of that love. And of course, if you've ever had that unconditional love, which is it's not just trying to keep you there, but just gives it to you and then frees you. I've had that from these great monk teachers I've known. I mentioned to as many of the monks that the first time I got this was from a monk, you know, not even Ajahn Chah. Ajahn Chah was too close to me, he's my teacher. I went to visit this famous monk called Ajahn Tate in uh, Sri Chiang Mai on the Mekong River over in the Nong Kai province in north of Thailand. He was supposed to be an amazing monk. In fact, when I first became a monk, you know, he was dying of cancer. He was in the main hospital being looked after by the king of Thailand because he was a famous monk. 
And the doctor said, okay, waste of time looking after you anymore. There's nothing more we can do. You're going to die. So he said, well, I might as well die in my temple then in Bangkok. So he went back to his temple and he died about 25 years later. <laughs> <laughs> and he was an amazing monk. And of course, he had such a good reputation that, you know, I could speak Thai. And I just wanted to go to these great masters and ask all my questions. You know, just like, you know, we all have these questions inside of us. And you get these incredibly wise beings. And you just want to just ask questions from someone who knows, knows what they're talking about. And so, you know, he was very famous, had to make an appointment, went up there, spent about two days waiting. When I went into his room, and you know what happened? All the questions totally vanished. My mind was so blank. But what I felt instead was this incredible, and I mean just incredible, unconditional love. I was a young monk. I still had my fantasies, my defilements and all that sort of stuff. And this guy, he loved me for who I was. I didn't have to become enlightened. I didn't have to sort of be a good monk. I didn't have to clean up my act. You felt totally accepted for who you were with all your faults. And that, that's the feeling I had. And as soon as I got a feeling like that, the next feeling I had, I, I don't want to move. I'm going to stay in here for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Because it was such a beautiful feeling of having this total, absolutely 100% acceptance. This guy would not criticize me at all and you never would and that unconditional love was something you could feel from other, another person now the simile which somebody gave later on I haven't shared this simile for a long time with you mm -hmm. is this uh, Western he said yeah he heard from another person sometimes his stories go down the line and they get added to subtracted to he said that people are like everybody has got spikes coming out of their body. He said, they're invisible, you can't see them. But some people have got very long, sharp spikes. You know, you, you go into the same room with them and you get scratched. You know some people, they come into the room and you feel really uncomfortable? Ugh. You know, they're very angry or very violent and you just want to get out. These are the ones with long, sharp spikes. Ordinary people have just got, you know, average length spikes. You know, that, you know, you get too close to them, you criticize them, you try and be funny with them, you get scratched. So there are some people, and these may be the people you live with, they've got very short spikes. You get too close to them, you know, even your lovers, you get too close, you get scratched. But there are some people in this world who've got no spikes at all. Absolutely none. You get as close as you like, you never get scratched. Those are very, very rare beings, and this was one of them. And you realize you're absolutely, totally scratch-free. And I love that. And this is what taught me, you know, about why can't I do that to others? Get rid of my spikes, my fault-finding mind, my critical mind, my I don't like you for doing this, I don't like you for doing that, why do you criticize me and I give even worse than you give me? Now that sort of stuff is spiky stuff. And we can actually do better than that. Have this unconditional acceptance of love. You're the most important person in front of me, and I'm going to care for you, no matter what you are. Now, I know most people think, oh, come on, Ajahn Brahm, this is the bad world. You've got to stand up for yourself. You've got to fight back. Whatever you get, you've got to give back even worse. Otherwise, people take advantage of you. Please, you can do better than that. It doesn't work that way. In the real world, and I know the real world, in the real world, when you give kindness, you get kindness back. More than you ever give. That's what I've done all my life. That's why so many people can look after me. Because I can get whatever I want. If I say I need something, I need some shoes, I'd have about 10 pairs by tomorrow morning. Why? Because so many of you love me. Why is that? Because I really care for you and you can feel it. There's no way I'm going to ever criticize you or harm you in any which way. And so that's something which is very beautiful, which gives life a bit of meaning. But it's still not enough. 
because a lot of that kindness and a lot of that love is just too, too busy. And it's something which is higher than love. And this is something I was talking a little bit about tangentially yesterday, uh, last week. Peace of mind. Contentment. That is when you're not just loving another person. That's when you're loving life in all its aspects. Just like I felt from that monk Ajahn Tate, I didn't need to change. With all of my idiosyncrasies and stupidities, I was loved. And now can we do that to life? With all of its stupidities and idiosyncrasies, you know, with the, the shootings in Paris, with the people, the little kid with leukemia, which I chanted for this morning, 14 months old, with all the tragedies of life, the pain of life, but also the joy of life. I know many people that come up to me and say, I love life. I say, do you? Really? Or do you just love the nice part? You love it when you're young? Do you love life when you're 80? Do you love life in the old people's home? Can you take that love to that level that you can love everything? A lot of people say no. But imagine you could. What would happen? Imagine if you could. Please excuse me again. Love the paedophile. What would happen? The paedophile being loved by somebody. It would change. The paedophile will be healed. Love the, the bank robber. The bank robber wouldn't need to rob any banks anymore. Because there's something about this which is caring for a person. Why do people do these stupid acts in the first place? No one's actually got into them and opened up their heart for them. They do things which are just so hurtful and painful and scarring others. But even the scars inside another, how do you get those scars out of the human beings when you have been hurt? You know, I know how to do that. It's not that hard to do. It doesn't matter how much damage has happened to you. The old story, damaged trees are the most beautiful ones. The crooked ones, the bent ones with scars on their bark. They're the ones that people love the most. You go into a forest, straight trees, yeah, the crooked ones, the bent, the ones which have been burned by the fires, the ones which have been damaged and got all these knobs on the bark, which have been bent over by the wind and the storms, which where the, the, the branches have been ripped off you know, by the heavy winds, and in their holes are just these birds find their nests. There's something beautiful about that. When we see the big picture, when we really understand life, strangely we can love the whole of it. Believe it or not, you are at peace with the world. Not trying to cure it, which most people do in their life. They find meaning trying to cure the world. And what do they do? They make it worse. How many people and you can really respect them, they're really trying the best they possibly can, you know, with the wisdom and the love which they have. You know, trying to just you know, stop slavery, try and stop the exploitation of the planet, trying so much, do you ever succeed? You know, I was doing that when I was young. And has the world got a better place? Pretty much the same, basically, as it was before. How can we do something with planet Earth, with all these people killing each other, having wars and bombing each other and just, and just uh, gunning down sort of cartoonists. I love cartoonists. Cartoons, when I ever get a newspaper, that's the first thing I do is look at the cartoons. And I'm irreverent and I value people being irreverent and just poking fun at others. I poke fun at others, please poke fun at me. I don't mind that at all because that is part of of lessening people's egos. And please, you have to do that to me a lot, because when I sit up here, 
and I've got all these people watching overseas. It's so easy for me to get you know, up myself. The great guru. You know, the great, that's why the, you know, I use these, these um, epithets for myself. People say, what's your title? Is it His Holiness Ajahn Brahm or the most venerable Ajahn Brahm? And I say, no, it is His Roundness Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> You make these jokes, and I do this to protect myself as well, so you don't get too arrogant and proud, which is you know, a huge danger. But, you know, why do actually people get like this? And is there another way? This is, you know, you try to help the world, but how are you helping the world? Are you making it worse or whatever? Is that the meaning of your life? Is that why you're here? Or is you're here to make peace with this world? And make peace with yourself? I told this lady last week, just I only had a minute because lots of people were waiting and I was getting tired. So it's to learn. That's why we're here. I don't mean learning about stuff in science. Because learning about stuff in science, I gave that up a long time ago. Trying to change the world, trying to find a cure for this and a cure for that. I mean trying to find cures for everything. And I don't think you ever will. Not for diseases. A cure you know, for fault finding, a cure for anger, a cure for being angry at the world, a cure for not being able to love the world and love yourself and love every human being and other animal and plant on this planet. And I do remember going to the old observatory next to Parliament House years ago, there was a seminar and that's where there was a Catholic girl, I really respected her honesty because she said with science, every time she looks through a telescope and sees an incredible universe, it challenges her Catholicism, the theology which you know, she's supposed to believe in. And they asked me, what did I think of that? And I said, as a scientist, because I did science in Cambridge, he said, as a scientist, I always imagine looking through the other end of the telescope, not the narrow end to the fat end, but looking at the fat end to the narrow end, looking at that end and looking in to see who's watching. That challenges my science. So what science is, is looking through this end of the telescope out there. What religion is, what it should be, what spirituality is, what Buddhism should be, looking from the other end of the telescope, looking who the hell is watching all of this and understanding that. Because that is where we learn finding out who's listening to this talk, finding out who is it who finds it so difficult to trust others, who is it who gets hurt, who is it who can't really love. That is what we find out. The meaning of life is to learn and one of the things we can give in Buddhism is how to learn. You don't learn in schools, you don't learn actually listening to monks like me. I just tell you how not to learn, what to sort of throw out. Where you learn is by getting that lake perfectly still. Because when the lake is perfectly still, I often use the simile, only when it's perfectly still does it accurately reflect the moon and stars above. But I remember this is the Buddha gave another simile. Only when the lake is perfectly still, when it's not a ripple or no current in that lake, only then can you see right down to the very bottom of the lake. To see the lake bed with the gravel or the fish, everything swimming in that lake, you can only see clearly when the lake is still and all of the the stirred up mud or other stuff settles to the ground. And when the lake has been still long enough, you can see right through it, right to the bottom, its foundation. And that's a very, very beautiful simile for how we find meaning in life. When we are that still, we can see right to the bottom of ourselves, see our foundation. See, all these little fishes which swim in our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, all that stuff we can all see. That is why we're here.
to see that. And that is how we learn how, what real love is. Loving the whole of life, not just the part you like. Thank you for listening. Very good. So, hopefully I get some questions out of that talk. Why we're here. So if you really understood that talk, I know you'll have really understood it because you won't be here next week. <laughs> Actually, I won't be here next week. I'll be teaching a retreat, but someone else will. So any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, yeah. Isn't, isn't life a bit like a joke? Like, um, like a... I just find, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for the lady who asked the question last week because it's, it's a question that I've, I've been asking all my life. Yeah. But um, it's, it feels to me like life is a little bit like a joke. Um, like a joke. That we come here and we spend all this time doing all these things just to undo all these things. Yeah. After a while you find you don't need to undo anything. That every part of life is just has its meaning. And even the painful part of life, you know, giving similes before, that's you know, the dog shit of life, which we use to dig under the mango tree to get sweet mangoes. After a while we find actually meaning in every part of life. There's nothing, at the end of your life, no matter what happens to you, all the pain and the beautiful joy and happiness you have in your life, and all the very, very bitter experiences of betrayal, of grief, of disappointment, all of those, at the end of your life you'll find meaning in every one of those experiences. It's hard when you're right in the middle of the shit, and please excuse me for using these words because You've got to use language which actually means something to people. And maybe that's my response. When I went to churches as a young man, all these priests, you know, they would speak in such dull language. It wasn't the language I spoke. And I react against that. I don't want to give boring sermons. I want to give something which speaks your language. When you're in the shit, you know, it's tough. And I mean really, you know, you've lost your mother in a car accident or something. Or you just, you know, I don't know how old you are, you're not very old. You know, you go and get something checked and you've got breast cancer. And you've got to get your breasts cut off. That's no joke. And at the time, it's shitty. Big time. But what you do with this, and it's amazing, there's people who, and I'm very well known at the Cancer Wellness Association, Support Association in Coddesloe. And just, I've been there and seen people and talked with them and been through it with people. They know how to dig it in. And they get incredible, wonderful experiences because of this. And you find it has meaning. Somebody dies in your life, like my father died when I was 16. I found meaning in that. Painful, disappointing, but you grew so much from that. You learnt. And at this stage of my life, I regret nothing. Much of it has just been incredibly painful, difficult, but so fulfilling. You see the big picture, you see right to the very bottom of the lake. And every fish in there is beautiful, even the ones which have bitten you. That is what we learn. That's what we're here for. And of course, you know, in Buddhism, once you learn that, you don't come back again. You're finished. But if you haven't learned that yet, you come back again to learn some more and some more. It's a very kind world in the sense that you don't need to rush. You know, just little by little, we get wiser, we grow. And we don't compare people either. Just no more that I can go to a high school. Yeah, the kids in grade 12, they're much more intelligent than, the, or much more knowledgeable than the kids in year, grade 8. It's only because they've been there longer. Well, some people are kinder, maybe wiser than others. It doesn't mean they're better. They've just been around a bit longer, more lives. They're not superior. They've just been around more lifetimes. So we don't judge. 
but we learn. Once you pass, and by passing it means no regrets. Forgiven everything, not just people, forgiven yourself and forgiven life for all the things which it does. Then you've graduated. Any questions on the internet? No. Okay. The internet is silent for change. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we can finish off now. Maybe I might get a really nice question for the next talk after we all finish. So let's pay respects to Buddha Dharma Sangha and then we can go to bed. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwa Demi Suakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammagnamasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangan Namami Just by the way, that you may see a couple of guys outside who actually just volunteer to patrol to make sure your cars are safe. So they're using high visibility jackets. So if you do see them outside, thank them for looking after your cars. <laughs>